you bring your Bibles? Can we open the Galatians 2 and verse 20? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Father, for each and every person. Father, you knew who was going to be here this morning and this afternoon. And so, Father, we pray that this would be a message that would be fresh manna, specifically tailored for the hearts and minds, especially those, Father God, that are struggling even right now. We know that you're the one that gives us our identity. You are the one that delivers us. You're the one that heals us. You're the one that sets us free. So we pray that each and every person that would come under the sound of my voice, that whether it be here or whether live streaming, we pray something would be said to encourage them. And we pray that when they leave here, they will not leave the same way, but they will leave empowered, that they will know who they are in you. So, Father, we just want to say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I just want to take a few minutes this morning. I'm not going to be before you long, but I would like for us to kind of look around and we see things that are going on around us. We see things in this nation. And there's times that we can look around and we can see, man, the enemy is busy. Man, the enemy is doing this. We see all the wickedness that's out there. We see the different kinds of lifestyles. We see that there are people that are going through. We see people that are losing their minds and people that are giving up. There is no hope. Well, I'm here to tell you today that this is not going to be one of those messages, amen? We have to understand as the body of believers that there are going to be times that we go through some things. You know, if we get our focus in the natural, if we get our focus into the weeds, sometimes we can listen to news programs on the right and the left, and the more you listen to them, the madder you get. We have to understand that when we see things, that a lot of times we can complain. A lot of times we can say, well, that's not right, or this is this way, and this is that way. But what we have to understand is that we can do something about it. Say, I can do something about it. You know, there's times that when we look at this nation, when we begin to pray and we begin to declare, sometimes it seems like nothing's happening. But the God, the God that I serve is faithful. That he wants us to keep our eyes on him and not on so much what's going on around us. The Bible tells us to watch and pray so we're not ignorant. And we understand that as God's believers that we are the source of change in this world. Do you understand that? The world is not going to change itself. So if we talk about harmony and unity, and we talk about us being one together, we are not one together with the world, but as we are one together, as we tap into what God has already implanted in us, that as we begin to pray, we can change the world. Do you believe that? Now, as we were sitting there in praise and worship this morning, the Spirit of the Lord told me that there are people in this place. There are people in this place that are at a desperate situation. There are people in this place that are thinking about giving up. There are people in this place that they're looking at their situation, and it doesn't seem like anything is going to change in their situation. They're looking at things. They're crying out to God. They're calling on God. But in their mind, they don't see anything moving. Well, I'm here to tell you today, don't give up. Say that with me. Don't give up. You know, there's times that it seems like the enemy gets us down. And if you know an MMA fighter, when they get down, where they talk about grounding and pounding, it seems like the enemy is just pounding out, down on us, and it seems like we're helpless against the onslaught of the attack. But I'm here to tell you today that you aren't helpless. Amen? That when the enemy tries to get us down, we won't stay down. Say, I'm not staying down. Say, I'm getting up. So I want to ask a question this morning. Who do you think you are? You know, as kids, a lot of times when we get out of order or we do something, you know, our parents would say, who do you think you are? <laughs> a lot of times we say, well, I'm sorry, you know, whatever. <laughs> the enemy asks us that same question. You see, the enemy can also try and use this phrase to try to intimidate believers. Especially when we're facing difficult situations or challenges. Anybody faced a difficult situation or challenge? 
You see, the problem is when we get our eyes on the natural things and we begin to focus in on the natural, we forget about the spiritual. We forget about who's backing us up. We're forgetting about the love of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone messes with my kids, I have a problem with it. Amen? It's the same with God, that he is watching over us. So when it seems like the enemy is getting over, we can't begin to buy into the lie of the enemy, that we are weak, that we're helpless, that we're pitiful and pathetic. That couldn't be further from the truth. See, if we get down are going through a wilderness experience. Anybody ever been in a wilderness experience? Wilderness experiences are not fun. They are lonely places. But I would submit to you today that wilderness experiences are absolutely essential. You see, when you come out of a wilderness experience, and guess what? Trouble don't last all way. You understand about the faithfulness of God. How many people know that God is faithful? My Bible tells me he'll never leave me nor forsake me. What happens when we get our focus on the natural things, we begin to move forward. And if we get our focus so much on the natural things, we're going to forget that God is backing us up. There's so many times that we don't understand that God is moving behind the scenes. And so when we get down, we need to keep moving forward. Say that with me. Keep moving forward. Now, we know that the enemy, he's very prideful. And when it seems that people are uh, getting over you, uh, getting over on you at work, or the enemy is busy, or you have a sickness and disease and you've been praying and you haven't seen the full results, then we need to use this scripture in the Word. And you can put your name in it. It says, I will look to the Lord and confident in Him, I will keep watch. I will wait with hope and expectancy for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. I'm here to tell you today about a God that is not a theory. It's time out for playing theories. You have to know that you know that you know that you're loved by God. I don't care how you feel about yourself. I don't care what the enemy says about you. You have to know that God loves you. Say, God loves me. God loves me. Now say it like you mean it. Amen. Watch this. I will wait with hope and expectancy for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And when we seem like it's almost all over and the enemy is jumping up and down and saying I won, then we can say this. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I don't care how dark it is. When you bring God into the middle of the situation with you, all things are possible. Say that with me. All things are possible. You see, God has to be a reality in your life. Sometimes when we don't feel it, my Bible doesn't say we walk by feelings, but we walk by faith. As we begin to develop our trust and our faith in God, our faith is in and of ourselves. In the world, they say that we should be self-reliant. I hate that lie. I'm a self-made man, a self-made woman. You couldn't do anything. The Bible says without him and apart from him, what? You can do nothing. Amen. So there are going to be some times we're feeling less than worthy. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> Amen. That we have to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That I am more than a conqueror through him that loves me. That God is my salvation. There are going to be times that we declare it. And there's just going to be times that we just sit and know that God is God. Amen. Amen. God is central to everything we do. When God asks us, who do you think we are? God uses this phrase to remind us who we really are in Christ. You see, as believers, the enemy wants to try and steal our identity. God uses this phrase to remind us who we really are in him. For a believer, our identity or the way we see ourselves is essential to living our lives in a successful and impactful way. How many people know that success to the world isn't necessarily success to God? Now, when, I, when you say, what is your identity, a lot of people are going to say, hey, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse, I'm a pastor, I'm this, I'm that. That's not your identity, that's what you do. 
Your identity is a child of God. That's the highest calling. When you understand you're a king's kid, that changes everything. That you understand that you are a person of the covenant. And my Bible tells me that God will withhold no good thing from his children. So say, I'm blessed. Amen. Amen. And so for a believer, our identity or the way we see ourselves is essential. If we know who we are, we can stand up against the devil and every foundational lie he tries to send our way. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And you know what? Even if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. You see, that's reality. That when you said, Jesus Christ, come into my life, from that instant, spiritually, you go from death to life. There's a lot of us that we can say, but God. That God intervened right at the right time. That God is there. How many people do you know that when you've gone through something, that God's been a right now, on time God? Amen? Everything Christians do starts with the relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You will get plugged into your identity when that happens. You'll get plugged into the meaning of life. You'll be able to operate in what God has destined for you to operate in. We understand that we are created in the image of God for good works. And so if you're looking for the meaning and purpose of what God has for you to do in this life, if you try to find it anywhere but God, you're going to be frustrated. You're not going to like it. But when you seek God, he will tell you exactly who you are. I know that because I was pre-med. But I remember one day I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Anybody ever been there? And I remember in my dorm room in Dinky Town, Minnesota, Minneapolis, I fell on my knees. I said, God, I'm tired of this. It's too hard. This is a struggle. Why? Because I was not in the center of where God had me. And I said, God, I just give myself over to you. Change what needs to be changed. Go before me. And he did. And he positioned me. So you may be feeling like God isn't here today. You may feel that you're off track, but guess what? We serve a God who is so faithful that even if you get off track, guess what? He'll put you right back on if you allow him to. Now we understand that before we came to God, it was all about me. It was all about my stuff. Me, 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 me. <laughs> Not your will, my will. But when we come to God, it's about his will. So that old nature changes within us. So in Galatians 2 and 20, it says, My old identity has been crucified with the Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him, and now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. In other words, not my will, but your will will be done. So we are created for God. We are created to give him glory. Watch this. For the anointed one lives his life through me. What are we showing people when we walk around? If we identify ourselves as Christians, what are we showing people? Are we showing people, are we looking like schlep rock? Oh, woezy, woezy me. Look at what the enemy is doing. He beat me up. He's doing this. He's doing that. Or when we're going through the middle of the storm, when we were singing those songs, we're going to sing louder. We're going to praise the Lord harder because we know that that's not the end of the story. Every storm has a beginning, a middle, and the end. But today we're coming out. Say we're coming out. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My life is empowered. Say empowered. By the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. God wants to live through us. Now, a lot of times we might not see ourselves as being the hands, the feet, the heart of Jesus, but we are Jesus' representatives here on this earth. And so when people see us, they should see Jesus. When we serve, we serve the same way that Jesus would serve. Amen? In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, it says, Now, any, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. 
All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything, say everything, is fresh and new. This includes our old identity, our old sin life, the power of Satan over us, when uh, religion, works of the flesh, amen, our old relationship with the world, and our old mindset. Say, I'm changed. I'm changed. I want us to use, for an illustration this morning, a picture of a solid block of stone. When you look at this image, it looks like it's just a worthless piece of rock. That's the image that the enemy wants to think that you are. Especially if you've ever had someone say, you're nothing, you're no one. But what God does, he doesn't look at us in this condition. God is the artist. He is the sculptor. You see, a sculptor, when they have a piece of granite, that they aren't looking at the granite. They're looking at the work of art that's on the inside. A lot of times when we go through situations and circumstances, sometimes the chisel is chiseling out some old things. Sometimes we have to make some openings for that art to come out. But once it comes out, it pops, and everyone's going to be able to see that work of art. When we look at this piece of rock, God is the one who understands what is that rock is supposed to turn out to be. The sculptor is the one who sees the stone but looks past all the mess and brings out the true work of art inside. He chisels and defines things. The thing that we have to understand that when we go through, a lot of times we want to be delivered. Oh, God, you know, get us out of this place. We, it doesn't feel good. Does it ever feel good sometimes? No, it doesn't. But we understand that we're going to have to go through some things. And here's the thing that we need to do. We need to stop taking the chisel out of the sculptor's hand. We just need to be the stone and let the master do what he's going to do sometimes. So my question to you today, who or what are we allowing to sculpt us? Is it our past? Is it things that people have said over us? Is it the way we think others see us? Is it a fear of man? How about negative words spoken over us? How about this culture that tells us what our identity should be? Or lies the enemy has told us about ourselves? The bottom line is, how do we really see ourselves? It can make the difference between success and failure. When you look through the Word of God, you see that when people understood who they were, when they understood that they were partnering and walking with God, when they followed the guidance and directions, all you have to do is look through the book of Joshua, and you can see time and time and time again that they were identified with the living God, and everyone else around them knew it too. Amen? And they had success. But those times we don't do that, those times that we look at ourselves as failures, you can see the spy in the land, and, and it says, and there, were, and, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so uh, we were in their sight. And that is a perception. You see, a lot of times we see things that, if we, especially if we haven't gone through those things before, we'll see those things, and that those things can intimidate us in the natural. But what we have to understand that we got supernatural backup. We understand that we have dunamis power, that we have ruling and reigning power, and it's in God. Amen? So our Christian identity isn't defined in terms of who we are in and of ourselves, it's defined in terms of what God has already done for us and the relationship he creates with us. He wants to form our destiny. God made us who we are so we can make known who he is. Our identity is for the sake of making known his identity. Everyone else is telling us what they believe in. What happened with the church of God? Why have we gotten quiet? We need to tell people who Jesus is, amen? Because he is going to be the answer to everything. Amen. We have to understand that each of us are uniquely made for God's purposes. How many people know from the youngest to the oldest that God has a plan and a purpose for you? Amen. I don't care whether you see it or not. I'm here today to tell you that God has a purpose for you. Amen. In Ephesians 2 and 10, it's talking about God's handiwork. Say, so we become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill, say fulfill, fulfill, the destiny that he has given each of us. 
we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works that we would do to fulfill it. And we understand that my plan is not your plan. Your plan is not your wife's plan. It's not your child's plan. Your plan is specifically tailored for you. And God wants us to experience what true relationship with him is like. He wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to partner with us. Yeah. Now, for those of you that have been following along and our family and that, uh, you know that I had my, we, we had our first grandson. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And he's a, 11 months old. How many people know that God can show you things? If your eyes are open, he can teach you. He can show you different things that we might not just see just out in the open. But when God opens your eyes, I look at my grandson, and it reminds me of the relationship. I love the way that we interact together. He pursues me, and I pursue him, and we enjoy our time together. It doesn't matter. I can walk into the room like, ah, here he comes. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I love my grandson. And I believe that this is the love that God has for us because he loves us. He wants us to run into that room. It's like, God, I love you. I don't need anything. I just want, I just want to love on you for a little bit. I believe that that's what God wants. Even yesterday, he was walking around like a, uh, some 11 months old. They'll fall every now and then. Well, he fell and he busted his lip. And I'm sitting here watching that. And I see his mom come running in from the other room, and she picked him up. All he knew was that he is loved, and he trusted the big giants that were around him. <laughs> Amen. And that he cried, and he just received that love. I believe that that's what God wants us to do. Sometimes we can get so adult-oriented uh, that, you know, sometimes we just need to lay in God's arms and if we're feeling a certain way, we can cry. That's okay. That's what God wants. That's the reality that when we go through different things, a lot of times we don't do that. Amen. And so when we see that we go through challenges and we have situations and circumstances that we go through, there's two things here that I want us to know. First and foremost, that nothing, say nothing, nothing. will separate us from the love of God. And then the second thing is, is that we have authority. Say, I have authority. I have authority. Now, in Romans 8, 37 and 39, it says, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Is that you? Yes. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things that come, height, depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So I don't care what the enemy says. When the enemy says you're all alone, who cares about you? Well, I'm here to tell you, God love you. Yeah. Amen. In Luke 10, 19 and 20, it says, now you understand. In other words, we have to understand this when we go through. We aren't helpless. That I have imparted to you all my authority. Say all my authority. To trample over his kingdom. You will trample upon every demon before you and overcome every power Satan possesses. Absolutely nothing, say nothing, nothing, will be able to harm you as you walk in this authority. In other words, we have to understand who we are, but we have to walk it out. Amen? So we see the 70 when they were sent out and they were rejoicing that the uh, that, that the demons were subject to them. But here's what Jesus said. However, your real source of joy isn't merely that these spirits submit to your authority, but your names are written in the journals of heaven and that you belong to God's kingdom. And watch this. This is the true source of your authority. How many people know if you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't have to take it? Say, I'm not going to take it anymore. We understand that our identity, our authority, and the confidence are forged in the quiet place of God. Yeah. When we go into the hiding place, the secret place, the place where we're covered under the shadow of God's wings, then God speaks to us. He talks to us. When we go to God, we don't have to say, oh, Father, how art thou and all that. No. What he wants us to do is come 
and pour out our heart before him. And the thing is, when you talk about communication, communication is two-way. Most of prayer is just going to be listening. There are going to be times that we just need to be quiet. And we're not used to that, are we? Uh Uh-uh, we always want to be talking. And so there's times that we just need to be still and know that God is God. God is the only one who gives us our true identity. Nothing or no one else can give us our true identity. Just knowing who he is isn't enough. Now, I know last week we were praising God. It was warfare. It's great. It's easy to praise God in an environment like this where his presence is. But what happens when you leave here? What happens on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday? If the only time that you get into the presence of God is on Sunday, that's not good. And so my question is, what happens if we're not connected in relationship, not only with God, but with his word? You see, God's word is alive. It's powerful. Amen? God's word is a sure foundation to help us keep anchored in the storm. It changes us. It cleanses us. It transforms our heart and our thinking. And ultimately, the word of God transforms our lives. There was a a program that Joyce Myers had on some years ago that talked about there is life in the word. How many people know this is the heart of God? This is the thoughts of God. This is what God thinks about us. This is what he says we have or what we don't have. Uh, A lot of times when people get a new car, they don't take the time to look through the manual to see what the capabilities of that car are. You see, if we don't take the time to find out what our cars are capable of doing, it doesn't mean that the car can't do it. It just simply means that we aren't utilizing the full capabilities. And so when we get into the Word of God, we hear and we understand the promises of God. This is exactly the same. If we don't get into the Word of God, when we don't take the time to study God's Word and allow the Holy Spirit to unlock all of God's promises in His Word, then we aren't going to be equipped and prepared to go to the next level. God wants to strengthen us and he wants to help us to grow. In Joshua, you see the marriage of the presence of God, the partnership of God, but then you also see the word of God in Joshua 1, 5 and 9. He goes on to say that no man will be able to stand before you to oppose you as long as you live. Just as I was present with Moses, so will I be with you. You don't have to have a title for God to be present with you. Say, God is with me. Amen. That he will be with you. And that is a promise from him. Listen to what he says. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and confident and courageous, for you will give this people as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do everything in accordance with the entire law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may prosper and be successful in whatever you do. Anybody want to be prosperous and successful? Amen. Watch this. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall read and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything. Say everything. everything. In accordance with all that is written in it, for then you will make your way process, and then you will be successful. And he knows that we deal with human nature. A lot of times we can question, but he even comes back there. So we really see relationship at the beginning and relationship at the end. Have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed, intimidated. Now watch this. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. God is with me. Amen. What would happen if the church really got a revelation of that? You see, God designs our souls to become whatever we give ourselves to the most. We can get connected to good things or we can get connected to bad things or things that are detrimental. We can get connected to things that lie to us, distract us, or deceive us from being everything that God wants us to be. And some of these things can make us weak, they can make us timid, they can deceive us and make us ineffective for what God wants us to do with him. But I want to use the example this morning. I was just working out in the yard 
uh, a couple of weeks ago, and God gave me this. And I asked the question, what are we connected to? And let's have the first picture up here. You see, we were um, cutting down some bushes, and we had some bushes that were disconnected from their life source. Amen? So being unconnected to God or connected to our culture, it's going to look good. It's still going to be green, but there's no life in it. So if we are connected with the culture, if we're connected what man says that we should be, then we aren't connected to God in that. Next picture, please. This is the result of staying unconnected to God or staying connected to our culture. It doesn't matter how well you think things are going. There is no life in that burn pile. Next picture. This is what it looks like when we come into the presence of God maybe once a week where we get refreshed in his presence. You see, this is good to be refreshed in his presence, but my question, are you connected to the life source? Because if you get refreshed in his presence, it feels good for the moment, but if our roots do not grow deep down into the word where we receive our nourishment, if we're not connected to the life of God, eventually that's going to turn brown too and it's going to die. Next slide. This is when we're connected to religions, man's traditions, or wrong thinking or wrong processes. You're connected to something but you see that there is no life in it. There is no life in religion. Sometimes we can get stubborn and say, you know what, I didn't do it that way, so I'm not going to change. You see, it's still connected, but there's no life in it. Next slide. And then the last thing is being connected to God and growing as his disciples. And you see that it's connected, that it's receiving nourishment, that it's receiving life. And I love the way God does that. When I took that picture, look at the bush on the left. There's still some brown in it. Which means that we're not perfect, but we're connected to the source. And given the opportunity, soon that will be green too. Amen. So we understand that when we come to the Lord, that we have to change, we have to be transformed. We look like the world, we act like the world, we talk like the world. And I'm just going to skip ahead in Romans 12 and 2. It says, stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed. Say transform. By the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. Change your thoughts, change your life. We change from the thoughts of the world, and as we change to the thoughts of God, then we will prevail. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in God's eyes. In other words, there's going to be a heart change. There's going to be alignment in thought, in purpose, and action. And so we see the example of Ross of being connected to God, which we saw in that picture. It's his word growing in us. It's his word strengthening us, that our foundation is being built up. God is into the bodybuilding uh, profession, amen. He builds lives. He builds people, amen. He doesn't beat people down, but he stands with open arms, amen. So we understand that God's expecting each one of us to get connected with him and continuously grow in him. See, we have to understand that Jesus' mission is our mission. The Bible says that the reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy the works of the devil. It's not just enough to have head knowledge of who you are, but we're going to have to go out and we're going to have to do battle. God has called his church to stand up to engage the enemy and take back ground that the enemy has stolen. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is if you understand truly who you are in God. We have to apply what God has already given us. It's not just to know the Bible. You can quote all the verses, but if there's no connection and there's no faith behind that word, nothing's going to happen. You see, we need to come out of our comfort zone. God is challenging us to be everything that he has called us to be. All the nice little pretty prayers, that stuff is by the wayside. Sometimes you got to get ugly in that prayer. You need to begin to declare who you are and declare that the enemy is a defeated foe, that that situation must change. I thank God for this girl, for this lady that was in our class. She had stage four cancer, and we were sitting here talking. And by the way, if you have cancer, 
Or if you had a report of cancer, don't ever say that word remission. I was schooled in that. She said, no, I was going to let cancer stay in my body. I am healed completely and totally. It's not coming back. Man, I was ready to give an altar call right there in that class. She knew who she was, and she activated that word. Amen. So we need to step out in every situation. Amen. We need to understand that we're partnering with God in his full authority. We partner with him in his power, his wisdom, and all his abilities. And you can put yourself in this in Acts 10 and 38. For God anointed and consecrated. In other words, he empowered and he separated us. Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with strength, ability, and power. How he went about doing good and in particular curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil. For God was with him. In other words, you're not alone. Last picture. The question is, who are you going to believe? On the left, you see a mess. On the right, you see organization. God says this is who you are. You may feel like that on the left, but God says this is who you are. Who are you going to believe in that? Amen. Do you know who you are? Amen. In that. I love this song uh, by people in songs. It's the, called A New Name Written Down in Glory. And we were singing in here last night. And the bridge of the song goes, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Say it with me. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And we were singing that. And as we sang that, people were getting happy because we understood that we are going to take what God gives us. Last scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Says who? The Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. And here's the key. When you call upon me and will come and pray to me, I will hear and heed you. When you will seek me, inquire for, and require me as a vital necessity, and find me when you search with me, what? With all your heart. God is looking for people that are going to trust him. He is looking for people that are going to search for him. When the enemy asks you, who do you think you are? Then we need to make some declarations in this place. Listen to this, and if, you say, and if you agree with this, say amen. In Christ, I'm an anointed and powerful person of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus and more than a conqueror. I'm a doer of the word of God and a channel for his blessings. If God be for me, who can be against me? I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. My enemies are fleeing before me. God has commanded his blessings on my storehouses. He has opened his good treasure and I shall lend and not borrow. I am the head and not the tail. He has given me power to make wealth. I dwell in the secret place. I have his protection and provision. God God is my refuge, my fortress. I'm not afraid of the snare of the fowler. No evil shall befall me. No plague shall come nigh me, my dwelling place. God has given his angels charge over me, and they're bearing it up in their hands, lest I dash my foot against the stone. I declare in Psalm 91, establishes that I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm a peculiar person called out of darkness into this marvelous light. I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Cancer, diabetes, heart disease, sickness sickness, afflictions, infections, or any other disease cannot enter my body. I'm not going to allow it to happen. I'm without spot or blemish, an intercessor, the righteousness of God, saved and washed in the blood of Jesus. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against me in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. I am saved from the wrath by him and justified by the blood of the Lamb. Who are you? That's who you are. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Can we go ahead and stand to our feet? With every head bowed and every eye closed, everything that we just talked about, if you have never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, it's not going to apply to you. You're going to be out there. You're going to be struggling. You're going to be looking, and you will never be everything that God desires for you to be. 
But God's desire is that none should perish, but that all would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Not to know about Jesus, but to know that when you ask him to be Lord of your life, that he is going to walk with you, that he's going to talk with you. Everything that you have need of, you'll never, ever have to walk alone again. You don't have to come in any special way. You don't have to say, well, when I get my life together, I'm going to come. God's just standing here with open arms. When I was talking about my grandson, it's like a lot of times I'll just be standing there with open arms and I just wait for him to come up and jump into my arms. That's the way God is. If we know that we have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. I believe that God's arms are open wide, and I believe that he will receive you. The Bible says that they should, that shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you don't have to come begging. You don't have to come pleading. Basically, just come. If something was said today to encourage you and you examine your heart and you've never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, we're going to pray a simple prayer in about a minute. That's the first category. The second category is if you knew the Lord at one time, but for whatever reason, you slipped away from him. And you ask, well, Pastor John, will God have me back? And it's like, absolutely. My Bible tells me if my people who are called by my name to humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. In fact, there'll be a party and a celebration in heaven for your return. And so you don't have to beg or plead. All you have to do is pray a simple prayer. And then for the third category, for those that don't know for sure whether they truly are saved, I know that there is times that I've doubted in my walk and I wanted to be sure that no matter what happens either on this side to know that if I died today that instantly I would be in the presence of God God wants us to have that assurance so if you never knew if you know that you have never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior or you've been in religion you see religion is not going to help you being a good person isn't going to help you Good works aren't going to help you. The only thing that's going to help is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That you'll walk in the fullness of who he has created you to be and that you will never walk alone in anything that you go through, no matter how hard the situation, no matter how high things are, that you will walk and he will walk with you. He'll talk with you. He'll take you by the hand and if need, you can crawl up into his lap. If you fall into any of those three categories with every head bowed and every eye closed, don't wait. Hold up your hands. Just raise up your hands to the Lord. You're not raising it up to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Is there anybody else? We're going to pray here in a minute. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Put your hands down if you raise them. Amen. We're going to pray a simple prayer. And we ask that everyone would pray it along with us as we lead them into the presence of God. Heavenly Father, I declare that you are the creator of the universe. That Jesus Christ came to this earth in the flesh. That he died for my sins. And that you raised him from the dead. I declare that he is alive and at your side. I repent of all my sins and I ask for your forgiveness. I declare Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. I declare that you are my heavenly Father. Jesus is my Lord. I thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that my life is changed that I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Cleanse me. Change me. Transform me. And I declare that I am saved. I am your child. And I am blessed. 
because you are my heavenly father and I thank you for it in Jesus name now let's give the Lord a glad hand clap